Hello, everybody, and welcome to Behind the Trowel. I'm your host, Natasha Bilson. Apologies for the delay. I was caught in traffic. I'm not lying. It's true. <laughs> it took me an extra hour and a half to get here, and I blame Citizen, aka Grant from Citizen, for uh, making me have that mac and cheese uh, whilst we're supposed to have been working. <laughs> rat him out straight away um, but everyone please head over actually and check out their youtube channel uh, which is citizen with an a or intertidal archaeology over on instagram it's a cracking account um, but today let's get on to today's live stream i am so happy to finally introduce a special guest rosie crawford who is studying an msc in forensic archaeology and anthropology hey rosie hello Thank you. I'm so sorry. Again, apologies. Thank you so much for your patience. It's appreciated. And um, you may recognize Rosie from her popular YouTube channel, which is now uh, known as Rosie Crawford, but you may also know it as Just a Little Rue, which is also her social media handles. And we do have the links to all of her social medias in the description below. So thank you again so much, Rosie. Uh, where are you right now? I'm currently in Cranfield in my university accommodation. So it's raining. <laughs> it has, it's, it's like a, yesterday I put a post uh, on Instagram and it's the, the weather kind of inspired uh, me to kind of do like an analogy between working in archeology span um, or transitioning from studying to, to trying to get a job, but to get in that job and then staying in the profession of archaeology. And just reminds me of like how, you know, this, this suddenly, all of a sudden out of nowhere, there's just rain. Um, and that's just the British climate, right? It just changes. As soon as you think there's a bit of summer, nope, <laughs> the cloud, the rain. <laughs> but um, I'd actually like the, in case the audience uh, is not familiar with you, it'd be really cool to, to kind of summarize your journey, not only in academia, but how you were able to put that onto social media, predominantly YouTube, because I came across your channel a couple of years ago and I cannot remember when it was. I was racking my brains out trying to remember, but I remember you as just a little brew. Um, so I'm not sure when you changed your name, but um, um, what is that transition like for you? Um, first studying it and then being able to create content online for it. So the reason I created my channel was it was as an access resource, first and foremost. I went to Oxford and I'm from a state school, the northwest of England. So like it wasn't expected. It wasn't a path that I ever thought I'd take. Um, and I felt like I had to give back. And I, I enjoyed it as well. It wasn't all I felt like I had to, but I wanted to give people who were in a similar position as me, the same sort of opportunities in a way that was free. And this was like the only way I could think of, was trying to put content out there that might inspire people both to apply to Oxford or university in general, but also archeology. span Because from when I was in first year, my experience was that most people who were also doing archeology span were either not intending on carrying on in archeology, span they'd just chosen it as a subject, uh, maybe someone had told them that it was an easy subject to do, like, and actually they wanted to go into politics or something, or they were just from quite, um, quite an upper class background and would perhaps find it easy to go into archaeology because they have sort of a financial base. So, like, when I was choosing archaeology, I was always faced with the, oh, there's not, there's no money in that. <laughs> are you sure uh, which is not wrong <laughs> but if if it's something that you really want to do then then you should do it and I just wanted that to come across in my videos and more recently I've tried to do videos that are sort of teaching and that came about mostly because I well I'd finished I wanted to wait till I'd finished my degree first because I felt underqualified without a degree behind me and then um, I started doing the study tube project which was basically a YouTube channel that was set up by a group of people who have channels like myself 
and we made a video each day that taught something that we'd learn and it was never meant to be like from a perspective of a professional it was just something that we were interested in and we had learned and we wanted to share that and I realized how much I enjoyed making those videos and teaching and I also worked in a primary school last year until until it was all closed down um, and I taught the seven to nine year olds prehistory and really enjoyed that so that sort of just watching how engaged they were was was completely worth it and I felt I got the same response doing it on YouTube as well and yeah I want to keep doing that I haven't really had time so much recently but hopefully hopefully I'll get more time because I've not done much forensic archaeology content yet I guess I still feel like I need to learn a lot more first but we're nearly at the end of the course so hopefully I've learned enough <laughs> Well, you know, you've actually tapped upon something there and it's the imposter syndrome. And <laughs> I've noticed like a lot of archaeologists have this and I don't know why we have it, but I've noticed every, nearly every single archaeologist I've spoken to really feels like, oh, actually, I need to do this to be able to speak about that. Or oh, I'm not an expert in, in this, though, no, you know, I, I must be doing it for you know 10 to 20 years before I can speak and, and have an opinion about it so it's really interesting that you've actually raised that as well um, and, and in regards to study tube I'm actually going to put a link in the description because I think that'd be quite good for uh, any students out there who may like to learn from you and the other YouTubers out there there's, there's so many things that you actually touched upon that resonated with me in the sense of how can we make archaeology and anthropology accessible how can we make it interesting for people of all backgrounds, no matter where you are in the world, and in this case, in the UK? So what has there been the response? Have you noticed that like demographic wise of those who watch your channel and who maybe uh, talk to you on other social media platforms, um, what age group are they roughly? Are they the sixth formers, uh, undergraduates? I thought, that they were going to be GCSE to sixth form age mostly. I was completely convinced that that was who was watching my videos. And then I looked at my demographics and it's actually more 18 to 25. Um, and I get a lot of messages about going into archaeology for a master's level. I do get people asking about undergraduate, uh, a lot of international students, which unfortunately I can't help them as much as I'd like, but I can offer some suggestions as to things to write on personal statements and applications and things and I think perhaps targeting it's hard because I when I thought I was targeting like 16 17 year olds because the messages I was getting reflected that but actually when I was looking at my stats it was more older so I think maybe just the younger individuals are more likely to interact so they're clearly getting something out of it and maybe that is still their age range to sort of target and social media don't want to like blow either of our own horns or anything but um social media does get to young people this is this is what they use it's it's what i say they i am also part of this like we respond to it, especially if it's personal. So like on TikTok, for example, there are quite a lot of archeology span TikTok profiles and anthropology, there's paleoanthropology as well. There's also paleontology and other sort of like niche interests. Just 15 seconds to a minute, they do up to three minutes now though, but I've not tried that yet, of just teaching an area of, of archaeology that interests you or something that is maybe shocking in terms of a gripper but maybe debunking a theory and things like that and using TikTok in a short snappy way is drawing people in and I think it's also showing that archaeology is not how it's presented in like Indiana Jones for example um, and helping to sort of debunk what we actually do 
And I think day in life videos are a really good way of doing that as well, because they're just honest and relatable and they show you as a person. And I've found that the main way to keep people interested and to keep viewers is to be as personable and as personal as possible. And just to make sure that you are you online, um, whether that's a good day or a bad day, it's all realistic. And that age group relates to that. It's, it's all about, as you said, relatability. Having somebody be able to connect with you when they're watching something that they can be like, I know them or I had a similar experience. And I think actually with YouTube, that's predominantly what it was at one point. I mean, everything changes now. Every platform's kind of crossing into linking with each other, especially yeah. after uh, lockdown. Um, but what you mm. said is so true about TikTok as well and, and how we can use it um, to debunk theories. It is <sighs> probably like the best and most fun yet stressful place to do it <laughs> because of all the comments that come in straight after. Yeah. Um, it, it's just it's it's amazing but it, it's just one of those things that people don't understand is that there's so much that goes into producing a video whether that be 30 seconds or an hour um, yeah. especially when you <laughs> yeah, especially once you want to do the research that goes into it and you want to show the resources you know all the sources that you use uh, and that that you recommend it takes time um, mm -hmm. and, and that's what I've noticed about most of us who do archaeology and history content in general um, the ones who are coming from a, a particular niche profession or specialism or uh, coming from an academic route, um, I've noticed that's the pattern that we all have. Like we're trying to debunk, uh, but we're trying to do it in a way where we show this is what our resources. Yeah. So you, you can't say that we're, we're making it up now. <laughs> so if we look back to your time at Oxford University, you did a Bachelor of Arts in Archaeology and Anthropology. First of all, what made you choose that subject and how was the experience for you? I'd chosen uh, archaeology, at least. I'd got that in my brain of what I wanted to do quite early on. So I was maybe in year 10, so 14, yeah, 14 or 15. And I'd just always been really interested in history. But the history that was taught in schools just, it didn't really it didn't keep me engaged at all. For me, it was too modern. So that was why I wanted to do archaeology more. Um, and I really enjoyed like human evolution TV programs and just more of the hands on stuff. And history just did not do that for me because it, it just felt like it was more books and a sort of he said, she said type thing, um, as opposed to actually finding things and interpreting it yourself. When I was younger, I just liked collecting things. I was really into fossil hunting, um, rock collecting, that sort of lame things that children, I still do now. So I am still that person. <laughs> Every time we go we, to the beach. We all are. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be like, hmm, there's a shoe in the water. How old is that? Um, and everyone else just looks at me weird. <laughs> But it stuck with me. And I think I've just always been curious about old things. And it probably stems from the fact that my parents are as well. And every holiday we've ever been on, whether that's an hour down the road on a camping trip, it's been centred around, OK, what stone circle can we see? Um, what Roman ruin can we walk to? And what museum can we go to on the rainy day? And I think it's just kept my interest going the whole way through. Saying that, my brother's very much less interested and he had the same upbringing. So not sure what that's a product of, but it just it just stayed with me. And I wanted to do it at uni because honestly, I spent a lot of time thinking, oh, maybe it's too niche. Why, why would I want to like, cut myself off so early and also I wanted to do fashion for a time but we'll brush over that I really like creative subjects I was a creative person and I wanted to I, I wanted to like be insightful and actually come up with ideas and things and for me archaeology just sort of gelled that together because it's not 
just looking at old things it's not just digging in the ground there's photography in it there's illustration in it there's there's a bit of math and chemistry and as much as I don't like it it's dare I say the fun side of like maths and chemistry like isotopes and things and I'm really into bioarchaeology which I looked for in a course at York that was one of my options on the UCAS form just it just interested me I don't know why it just did I liked I liked learning about how people interact with each other and the environment and what the evidence for that might be and that was one of the reasons why I ended up doing archaeology and anthropology and, and I chose it based on purely based on um you know like the course pages on in, on the internet um I read what like the modules were and it broke down what the core modules were what what option papers you could take and I chose the ones that had the most points on those lists that interested me and had the most avenues for things that I wanted to ask questions about so like if I saw a few things on there and I was like oh yeah I'd love to learn more about that because I want to know about this I knew that would keep me more interested than a course in archaeology that I don't know was mostly about pots or buildings because I was interested in the people and doing it with anthropology meant that that was more central now I, I did enjoy social anthropology um not as much as the archaeology but I knew that from the start I was wanting to do archaeology but there was a module on paleoanthropology so again like blurring the lines between archaeology and anthropology is sort of still where I'm sat now with forensic anthropology and forensic archaeology so again the the biological aspects and the interacting with the surroundings but I didn't know we could apply that to a modern context until like my second or third year of uni so you're not supposed to know like exactly what you want to do before you get there you change as a person and work out what you actually like and also find out things that you just did not know were possible for you to do so I understand some people going into archaeology would be like oh I can only work in a museum or I can only dig because that's all that's really presented to people as like a standard career out of it but actually there's so much you can do and I just didn't know that until I got there like the amount of people now who I know who are actually in archaeology is quite small I've got friends who did go into po politics I've got friends who are doing archaeological consultancy um looking at heritage just like the general local environment um yes there are people doing museum studies as well and helping with repatriation and things and it's just actually such a wide variety of things you can do and I'd quite like to show that <laughs> on my channel as well not that so, I have a career yet. <laughs> well so, so archaeology is not as niche as you thought that's what we take yeah. <laughs> it, it's, it's it's one of those things uh recently I, I was in a conference and and somebody said that there's around 84 85 career paths in archaeology and I was like wow and then thinking about it yeah there's there's pollen experts yeah like there's, there's you know there's people who can look at a seed you know these are like environmental or archaeobotanists um we have various uh, names for them the produce of my cat um, <laughs> We have, yeah, zoo archaeologists as well, you know, and it's just amazing what we can tell from material culture. Um, you mentioned uh, you like to look at the relationship between the people and environment. So how have you been able to, to carry that on and that theme of that interest into your current studies of forensics at Cranefield? So I... Well, my dissertation project, for example, um, is on it's on smallpox uh, in the archaeological record and spe specifically, can't speak, specifically the manifestations of the disease on bone and also the context around it. So without going into too much detail, the site is unusual in terms of it's got um, paleopathology, which basically means like 
old disease, like disease on archaeological skeletons that you wouldn't expect and other things that you wouldn't expect. And I'm trying to at least look into why a little bit and how changes in the environment or perhaps inconsistencies in diet, for example, can then impact the skeleton. So isotopes, again, are pretty cool. I'm really into isotopes. <laughs> for example, if you lived in a certain place when you were little, when your teeth were forming, then your strontium isotope signature will reflect where the teeth grew. So you can see if people have moved during their life. And that for me is, is sort of like objective evidence for interaction with the environment or just like migration and moving and then looking in potential reasons why or using it as a wider picture of how people dispersed and what the reasons might be. There's a really interesting paper using strontium about Stonehenge. I'm pretty sure it's Snowick et al. 2016. Um, but if you're interested in isotopes or just, you know, like uh, chemistry and archaeology, that's a really interesting paper because it talks about uh, one, the isotopes, but also two, like where the stones came from in Stonehenge. And then it hints at movement and the relationship between the environment in Wiltshire and Wales. Um, and it's just it's an interesting like anchor to get you to get you interested in the archaeology. Good to hook you in, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I must admit, isotopic analysis is one of the, the few terminologies that I remember from my undergraduate, even though I did do a Bachelor of Science at Bournemouth University, archaeology. Um, we did do a lot of lab work and something about isotopic analysis, I was always like, wow, that is unbelievable technology. And actually, uh, a couple of months ago, we were able to interview it at Erin Ray, who is currently doing a PhD on isotopic analysis, and I'll put the link here and in the description as well. Um, it's just super fascinating. And in regards to that paper, um, after the live stream, I will, I will add it into the description box for everybody to have a little Google over. And maybe who knows, you could actually make it, that'd be a really fun video to make. Just to yeah. add to the list of things that you, you know, could create if you had the time. <laughs> I, I made one on, what's, I wanted to make one on uh, nitrogen and carbon, but I'm yet to do the strontium one. So it's coming. Okay. Probably. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> nice. I well, this is the thing. It's so nice to speak to somebody else who creates content whilst actually, you know, studying, working as well. It's hard. <laughs> it's so hard to juggle so difficult um and even now I was just like panicking on the way back it's like am I gonna make it <laughs> to make this and and it's one of those things like it's I, I do feel like it's more important now that we try as a community to engage with the public especially what is going on in, in the current UK mm -hmm. circumstances of archaeology whether we look at universities or the commercial sector uh, generally speaking, we always kind of split them in two when we're talking about archaeology, but there are, as you mentioned earlier, other departments that have archaeology in it. Um, but I don't know why. We always just split it directly, don't we, between academic and commercial. Um, yeah. That's something we need to look into as well. It shouldn't always be so separate. I mean, it is intertwined. Right. It's the same with trying to get work as well, because the work is in the commercial sector. But if you're coming from university, you can't even meet the entry level requirements of three to six months in commercial archaeology because the only way you can do that is through a training a trainee scheme which hopefully i will be doing but it especially considering the the short the shortfall of archaeologists at the moment and the amount of companies who are advertising you'd think that they'd update like the job descriptions to include you know like university training digs uh, summer schools community digs that people can actually access without having to commit to a trainee scheme or anything it it's, it's my problem at the moment <laughs> I'll tell you a little tip then for anybody who's watching 
Yes, these are the requirements. However, when there is a large demand for archaeologists, and you see that on platforms such as Badger, which is BAJR.org, I'll put that in the description below, and I'll tag the video that I had um, with the David Codney. Um, you will notice that, yes, they say three to six months of commercial field experience. However, you apply for those jobs anyway. You put in your cover letter, um, I um, have this amount of, you know, university led field schools, just put it. I have two months experience, I have one month experience, but I want to learn. I'm eager to learn and develop my skills. And I'd like to work with your company because blah, blah, blah. Find something you find interesting mm -hmm. about that company or a project that you know that they've worked on, you found it fascinating when you were able to read or watch a video about it. So these are ways to kind of get the attention of the recruiter who's gonna see your email because they're gonna be getting hundreds of emails, right? Every job. Yeah. So apply in the cover letter. It's okay if you don't have the experience, but if you're eager and you're ready to work like yesterday, this is how it works, okay? You're applying for a job and say, yeah, I'm ready. Like, give me a day's notice and I'll be there. You know, that's what they want. They want yeah. somebody immediately. Don't wait till the last day to apply for the job because probably it's already gone by the time. Mm -hmm. It's so fast paced. Commercial archaeology is fast paced because we're working with construction and construction it's is constantly only, going, stopping. On a contract basis, right? Yeah, so it is all contract based. So archaeological companies, they tender for these projects, which is a bit of a, an issue, I think. This is where we get the competitiveness within the archaeology commercial setting and because they're competing against each other for the, for the, for the job. And they say, this amount of time, I'll get it done um, in this, so this many days. I need this many uh, field staff. And that's where the pressure comes on to the field team because of this, mm -hmm. this pre-agreed time frame. Um, then you get the contracts. Now, contract work of the archaeologist, luckily, I've not heard it for a while. Um, it should be, generally speaking, from at least you know, a four-week contract plus. When I started out, they were like one-week contracts. Um, and thank, yeah, thankfully, I've not heard anyone <laughs> recently say that they're getting one week contracts. Now it's like three month contracts, six month contracts. Um, if you don't have commercial experience, they'll just give you, you know, the pay grade will be a trainee level, trainee archaeologist. Um, now a lot of companies do have these graduate schemes, these trainee schemes for uh, entry level positions for uh, individuals who don't have uh, an archaeology degree, who have no archaeological experience, there are ways now to come in. I know MOLA recently um, had a scheme that I've seen online. So there are definitely a lot of uh, companies now who are trying to get you know, more people into the industry and, and do that mentorship. That's the good thing about these graduate schemes is the concept. It's the concept, right? I don't know because I never got to do one. Um, it's the concept of mentorship. Um, so definitely something to consider but don't worry if you can't do yeah six months to a year some, some of those ones are you just apply for the job as normal and they'll say to you okay you don't have commercial experience so we're going to give you this pay grade after x amount of time you'll be put up to the archaeology grade um, and yeah. that's literally it and most companies are still doing that frame they don't have the, the technical graduate scheme or training scheme um, so pros and cons to, to every company is different depending where you are in the UK. If you work in London, you're going to get a bit more money. Um, bear that in mind. Um, if you really want a job, um, be open to moving. Yeah. Get a driving license, get a CSCS card. Um, I'll, I'll add this actually into the link for, for anybody who's thinking about it later. Um, but th there are so many different avenues. Um, so don't worry. And be prepared to not get emailed back when you apply as well yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's just so normal it's part of the experience unfortunately unfortunately it's a part of um trying to get that experience and with everything that's going on with lockdown measures um there's no opportunity to really go abroad so there's more uh, yeah. individuals so it is a shame in that sense because at least you could look forward to going abroad have you excavated on international territory I, in 2019, when I finished my degree, I went to Cima de las Palomas um, with Maria, who you've interviewed before. Ah. Maria, okay. um, I met her there and I met some other archaeologists, uh, James and Gonzalo and Julia will all be watching this, so hi. <laughs> they, we all like different specialisms, but came together and it was paleoanthropology, it was a paleolithic site 
very, very different to anything I'd done before. Um, I say anything, I'd only done two, but one was Roman on a training dig with uni and one was a community dig, which was just a mill site. It had burnt down in the 1700s and they were like trying to rescue it because uh, the water table was like damaging stuff. Um, whereas this site was in a pit, it was like 35 degrees. The in order to get in it, you had to climb up a mountain and then down a ladder, and it was t- kind of terrifying. But you got used to it by the end, of, <laughs> by the end of the two weeks. Um, and we also there got to experience not just the excavation, but finds processing as well. Um, so we did flotation, cleaning, sorting. Um, by the end of it, I could put them into boxes of microfauna, macrofauna, tortoise. Tortoise has a separate box because there was so much of it. Um, fun fact, the tortoise was burnt on one side, so they thought maybe it was uh, a bowl that they'd cooked with the fire underneath. And it was Neanderthal uh, age, so... I find that really interesting because Neanderthals get a bad rep, but there's so much evidence to say that they were pretty smart. <laughs> um, and I found a lot of lithics, a lot of lithics, which was really exciting. So if you don't know what lithics are, um, they're basically stone tools uh, from, we were 120,000 years ago on this level. And I'm not sure how deep into the context we'd got, but they'd been they'd at least gone through quite a lot of different ones it's been open for about 20 years and at one point they did find a neanderthal skeleton and another one that was a child so an adult and a child uh uh, i was meant to go on one this summer like in september i was meant to be going to sardinia to do uh, a roman dig with grampus heritage completely free and paid for by Erasmus and unfortunately um I don't know what's gonna happen anymore with Erasmus because it well it doesn't include the UK now um but (laughs) hopefully hopefully they accept you for another one if they get to because I actually I did one as well Uh, I went I did I went to Cyprus with Erasmus oh brilliant yeah I was really looking forward to it and to be honest even if it does still go ahead they've extended my dissertation deadline so I'd have to I'd have to be like I'm sorry um we were too disrupted during the year so like I'm, I'm, I need to finish my degree <laughs> um because I'm enjoying my research and I'd quite like well I want it to be as good as it can be so I think I'll be working all the way and then there might be potential for going to Sicily and then Austria with Cranfield's recovery and investigation of conflict casualties team. So that's forensic archaeology, which you can't really get experience in without joining like these very specific organisations. And thankfully, because Cranfield have trained us, it's a bit of an in on that. Um, Although there are outside people in there. So if, you know, forensic archaeology is your specialism, or archaeology in general, then you can always apply to them as well if you're interested in, they're mostly World War II, plane crashes and um, American, they're funded by the DPAA. So all, don't ask me what that stands for. I actually don't know which I should, which is embarrassing, but they're like an American war casualty funded funded body that goes and retrieves and repatriates their war dead from foreign countries um but again covid means i have no actually no clue what is gonna happen or whether whether it's gonna be going ahead or not oh well (laughs) it's okay there's other opportunities and um it's it's in a way it's it's great to show people that as you said archaeology is not all about digging or working in a museum there's so many different things that we do and we can do um, to continue the profession and academic learning and research. Um, I'm curious actually about, you know, when we, we always think of theory, when I think of Oxford University, I think of it very being very theoretical. Um, 
and Cranfield, in a way, I mean, it's both. It, it seems like the yeah. labs are amazing. I've seen the, the refurbishment photographs by uh, Dr. Campbell and oh my goodness, the facilities look fantastic. Um, I'm actually jealous. Like, I want to go back to uni now. Like, I'm like, I want to, I want to learn how to do forensics. I like to do I mean, C- CSI. Honestly, um, I haven't been able to experience them um, because of COVID. It like delayed the the building plans, and also we weren't allowed inside because lockdown, and then tier four. So we haven't had access in the same way that people from next year will and I am very jealous of them (laughs) but this week we're just getting our postponed practical sessions from January in forensic anthropology so we've been in the lab and not really doing lab stuff but just analyzing human remains like and animal remains but so far we've been doing bones based off photos again Covid just meaning we can't like go in and all pass around a skeleton (laughs) um but it's nice to actually apply the theory that when I applied to Cranfield I thought that I'd be leaving just theory behind not taking into account the fact that we were about to go into a global pandemic (laughs) so it's been nice to actually get that back um, and same with the more scientific e-forensics lab stuff. We missed out on things like um, blood analysis um, and had to do it online, like make a swab out of whatever we could find and wipe ketchup, as opposed to them getting, uh, honestly, I don't know what they get. Fake Maybe blood, fixed blood or something, probably. Yeah, um, and then analysing it in the lab. We did get to do the entomology stuff. That was really good. We got to actually use the microscopes and like look at the flies under the microscope, look at the soil, collect soil samples. That module just came at like the perfect time between lockdowns. So we actually got to do it. Um, But they've just finished a crime scene house, which we didn't get. We had to do it outside, which was fine. But now they get basically this it's called building 33 that's all I've heard it referred to as but essentially it's got different rooms with scenarios that they've like built up and then there's a fake body in each one and they have to collect evidence and make scene notes and do everything that you would do uh, in a crime scene if you were going into CSI the forensic anthropologists and archaeologists wouldn't do that that would be the CSI's job Uh, but it is it's useful to at least understand the general process because like I've never done forensics before this year so at least learning about you know the different standards you have to follow the the guidelines and like writing expert witness reports where if for example I was called to be a forensic archaeologist on a case what I would do is I would potentially most likely be helping to assist in finding buried human remains or just buried evidence and I would apply my archaeological expertise to this criminal case. I might excavate a body and then have to lift it and package it, um, assess if there's any cut marks in the ground, although that's mostly for a cut mark specialist, (laughs) but I could at least take pictures, say, say they're there, say that it's got a single context so instead of different layers building up over time it's been filled in one go Um, and it's all of this archaeological knowledge that they apply and try to build up a sequence of events and what's happened in a criminal case it's not been around that long um but but it's now being used more and more in across the world because I mean I do it so maybe it's biased but I think it's a vital part of like you can't if people don't have experience of excavating and finding evidence then you're not going to do a good job of it like I didn't the first time I did it it takes it takes a lot of practice and then you could be a reporting forensic archaeologist so basically the lead one and the lead one will 
oversee the dig, um, essentially be responsible for everything that goes on because they're under your leadership. And then you take it to court. So you have to write a report, document everything you did, the methods used, why you used them, what you found, your expert interpretations, potential other interpretations. But then essentially your report is trying to help the court. So you're not trying to help the prosecution or the defence that would be bias. You're just trying to help the court. So you're trying to help the judge and jury assess the evidence based on your uh, your experience, um, which I genuinely did not have a clue about before this year. So that has been great. <laughs> I've written a lot of expert witness reports now. Um, Probably should have got more guidance. That's one thing I wish I did get. But again, I think COVID just meant that we didn't get some of the sessions that we were meant to have. So we were sort of just left to to get on with yeah. it. Yeah, I, I do feel like um, when I speak to students, they, they all feel like this, no matter where they are, because I think it's just been such such circumstances that the lecturers that I think could even cope with the workload. Yeah and what their expectations became like all the work that they had to put into create all these online um content right like all these pre-recorded videos that they had to publish them like yeah. i don't know how i don't know how anybody was able to function during this time in, in that sense and be able to graduate you know and get the experience as well that you wanted and that you expect when you pay so much money um you know to attend yeah. a university in the uk that is um and loads of other countries like it's crazy the amount that people pay to study um and it's I think, yeah I can imagine it quite being stressful yeah the only saving grace for me is that <laughs> Oxford was so like that without a pandemic that I'd sort of got used to dealing with having to just do it with not a whole lot of guidance essentially um I, it might have changed now but when I was there we there was maybe one or two lectures every day, but probably one. So not many contact hours at all. And then most of your learning would come from your tutorials. So you'd get two reading lists a week and you had to make two essays a week. Um, it tended to be two one week, one the next, but some terms it was two both weeks. And honestly, why? That's a whole separate <laughs> issue, but... Um, like it was just completely independent and they didn't film anything so like if we missed it we missed it I'm hoping now they've learned a lesson on that because they're gonna have to record things um and I hope it's I hope the pandemic has helped them update their system a little bit um because in my opinion it was a little bit outdated you know like all of the assessment was based on the dis which was 15,000 words and 22% of the grade. Honestly, I loved that. I think that I actually got to show how into it I was and how much work I was willing to put in. Whereas the seven exams that made up every other percent of my grade that we did in two weeks in final year, it's just like a memory test just isn't a fair way to assess an entire degree in my opinion <laughs> um, and I think that that has been the, the best difference between Oxford and Cranfield is how it's been assessed because now if like I, I didn't do badly at undergraduate by any means but I felt like I could give more and I felt like everyone else was just doing so much better um, but I think it was more the learning style was just like I, I'm better at coursework and my dissertation proved that for me um, and this year has that has been really good and like choosing a university I didn't realize at the time how important it was to look at how things are assessed and whether that suits you because the differences in how different universities do assess students is it's vast you know some universities will base a lot on group projects presentations practical sessions others will do it like Oxford purely on exams and 
I sometimes when I was there I wished I'd chosen somewhere that had more emphasis on practical seminars and teaching you how to like actually do things that you could apply to jobs in archaeology like uh, GIS software or mapping using things like Inkscape or Illustrator to to do plan drawings everything about that and like excavation process I've had to learn myself afterwards or during this course and considering it was a three-year degree in and half of it was archaeology the the lack of anything other than theory did did not help that it kind of lends itself to a career in academia um like straight off <laughs> without anything else the only saving grace was that there was a field work after first year and you had to write a report no one told you how to write the report but they they paid for two weeks of field work uh camping but it was great we got to like meet each other unfortunately I don't think they they do that anymore I don't know whether COVID's just disrupted it too much but as far as I'm aware they stopped that and then we had to pay for the other three weeks so which sorry. What, what what I'm confused one minute so yeah <laughs> so it's a compulsory five week yeah dig, and they're paying it for was, two weeks uh, it was a two-week dig and then you were left to find the other three weeks oh right okay so okay um so the two weeks was like the practice week and then they'd send you off on your way mm-hmm. they, they gave a small like a small stipend uh it's not even a stipend it was like 200 pounds <laughs> which doesn't cover a lot when it's three whole weeks um but for me I could only afford to get the train into Manchester and I live near Manchester and that used up all of it for like my lunches like a meal deal every day and the train fare whereas some people were going off to like Africa to excavate um so like there's an issue and it's not just Oxford I've got other friends who did archaeology in different places and that sort of elitism it's both damaging and also makes it really hard for students who don't have the funds or you know like financial base to properly explore the things that they're interested in and I don't think the pressure of it should be put on students as much as it is to to go off to places I can't remember what university it was, but they expected you to pay for the, the entire five weeks. I think it might have been Edinburgh. Which you just, uh, wow. yeah, not I'm everyone. Surprised. I mean, it's crazy, actually, when, I mean, I, re- I knew in, in, you know, I speak to friends in, in America, that they had to, they were expected to pay as well for their field school. Um, but at least in the UK, I thought that we had, that people would have a little bit more support. I guess I was very fortunate to go to Bournemouth um, because we had a five week dig um, and that's it. You just go to uni, there was a bus for you. You jump in that bus, go to site, you know, <laughs> you come back and the, the bus drops yeah. you back to the university. Um, I, I guess we take it for granted. I know Reading as well um, yes. had a similar Reading sort of setup. Yeah. Um, as well, everything's in with it. Like that's in your course fees. Um, mm. but I don't know maybe it's it's there it's are like a lot of universities it's an universities. issue I think yeah. I'm curious so okay so with Oxford you only had to do one year well one in your first year you had the compulsory field work that you had to take part in and, and that was it so five weeks yeah. basically in, in the three-year degree five weeks that's quite interesting um yeah See, I'm trying to remember, because it's, it's many moons ago <laughs> for me. <laughs> um, if I remember correctly, first year and second year, we had to get um, five weeks, but then we had the option to actually go on the, the dig that was facilitated at the university. Uh, it was run by Dr. Russell and Dr. Cheatham. Um, awesome site. Sorry to rub it in. <laughs> it was a great <laughs> site. <laughs> and I think they're still doing it, but... Um, how is it then at Cranfield with the ex, like the actual practical side? I know you mentioned already earlier, but I know you recently just came from 
um, some digging yourself because the photo that I used to advertise and even in the thumbnail for this YouTube clip, we see you in your um, hazmat suit <laughs> and you're excavating these fake uh, human remains. Yeah. Um, what exactly did that part entail, that part of the workshop? Um, and how was that experience, that actual like excavating part? That has been the best part um, by a mile. So the practicals excavations that we've done, we did one in November that was just forensic archaeology. So that was a single grave. Then I took the practical archaeological excavation module. So we went to um, Northamptonshire and excavated a site and it was a new site which was exciting and they've said we can like go back next year and stuff and that was in with it and they we basically like were taught the basics again but I feel like you need to just be taught it over and over because <laughs> it's so complicated like filling all the forms in labeling the bags getting the symbols right it's a lot to get your head around if you haven't consistently done it for a long period of time um and that was a Roman one. So that was like archaeology, archaeology. We didn't have to wear the suits or anything. And then that was five days, Monday to Friday. And then we started next module on the Monday. So that module was mass graves. Again, forensic archaeology. But it was taught by a tutor who has basically been doing that for a lot of years. Um, he's excavated in Bosnia. And we were sort of replicating that um so we got given a scenario and we were told that a previous team had confirmed the fact that there were people buried in two separate graves um, again all plastic <laughs> and not real this was on campus um and we just had to do the whole process and it took six days and we had to excavate them choose whilst working what the best method is um and then excavate uh, these these people lift them lift the skeletons um and it was as if it was real so everything had to be done you know ethically with all the safety precautions um and and how you would how you would in real life um <laughs> there's I think one of the pictures that you used was me lying on a plank um and the basically the plank oh it was terrifying it, it took about five minutes of like convincing myself to do it it doesn't look scary but it really didn't feel stable <laughs> I was this. ashamed I, 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 when I saw the image and actually looked at it properly I was a bit surprised that um you are using a plank so that was recommended to do as a technique for being able to reach over yeah. because in in forensic archaeology um particularly in the mass grave excavation the aim is to recover the people and to get them back to their families and identify who they are so as long as you've picked up got any evidence recovered it recorded it you can put this plank in and as long as it doesn't like squash anything, because that would not be good. It's the best way to be able to like clean and get behind uh, clothing or any bones that might be in a weird position and to actually be able to clean it enough to photograph it, take points of each like aspect and properly mark out where in the grave things were. And because that skeleton was in such an awkward place, I think it was the only one that needed uh, the plank just happened to be the one we'd been allocated to call. <laughs> but it was, it was fun to, to experience that. Um, I didn't think that like when they'd been saying for days, Oh, we can get the planks out. And it just didn't register in my brain that that's what they meant at all. Um, and yeah, they're kind of like having to like dive on, not dive, but it felt like, it felt like a dive onto it. It was a bit scary, <laughs> but fun. All part of the experience. <laughs> yeah, and we got to survey as well. So they taught us to use the total station and GNSS. Again, I don't know what it stands for, but 
it basically measures the coordinates. I assume you probably do know what it stands for. <laughs> yeah, you're on about you know about the one from your picture, the Global Navigation Satellite System. Yeah. Yes. Yes, I do know stuff. <laughs> I, yeah, I think that's what it was. So it, it, yeah, it makes sense. Um, actually, just before I forget, because I keep forgetting to say this, everybody, don't forget this is a, this is a live stream, so it's interactive. If you have any questions for Rosie and myself, please put them in the chat box and we will get to them. Quick shout out. Hello to Anthro Joe, Nigel, nice to see you both. Thank you for your comments as well. Um, <laughs> Nigel, I must admit, quickly jumping back about the about the turtle shell, um, I have heard about turtle soup. Um, I remember traveling once. Um, where was I? I can't remember where I was. Um, and actually, they would use the the shell of the turtle. So when you actually mentioned about the bowls, I found that quite interesting. But yeah, it's it's amazing how human ingenuity and like you you know you try to use what's around you. Um, and how we're still basically doing the same thing in in a way in certain parts of the world. Um, yeah, it's my so, like party fact because I found it so cool. I tell it everybody. It is really Imagine. interesting, <laughs> uh, especially in the Neanderthal site as well. Um, that's fantastic. Um, really, really, really interesting. Yeah, I'm I'll literally sat that. at my table with some lithics as well. Classic archaeology person, just like these, for example. Um, Where's my yeah. So when, when I was saying lithics, these aren't Neanderthal, these are later, but this is the sort of thing that, that's what I mean. Like little stone tools. Someone gave me these. <laughs> Someone on, on the dig that I was doing, um, the Roman one a few weeks ago, there was a guy there who was like a local um, and he was helping and for some reason he's got loads of these and realised I liked them and just brought in a box one day and I was like, thank you. By the <laughs> way, that, that's, that's a, a good thing to raise. If there's anybody watching and they find, this is for UK based folks, if you find something whilst you're walking like um, on the shore, wherever you live, um, and you find something like these lithics, um, it would be great if you could note the location of where you find it and then tell your local PAS officer, which is the Portable Antiquity Scheme. Um, generally, the local museum, you'll be able to find uh, your local representative where you can Google. And actually, I'll put them in the description below. Um, because for us, you know, sometimes when people are field walking, that's actually a technique that we use um, when we're trying to stake out an area. If we don't have drones and, and other things that like LIDAR to, to scan the area, um, field walking is one of well it's the cheapest um way to, to to stake out an area of potential archaeological site so if you were to find something in your land or you're just going for a walk please just do like a geo location and send that information um because you never know that could be the small piece of the puzzle that changes everything <laughs> from yeah. a forensic perspective as well um similarly if you find bone that you're pretty sure is not animal um Hopefully you never do, but if you do, then take a photo of it exactly where it is. It's just so there's like contextual information so that in case it gets moved after that, um, you've at least got that evidence and a timestamp of when you found it. Don't send it to anyone uh, other than like the police, but call the police there and then, and then they will contact like a forensic anthropologist to check it for you um but it's, it's important that if you think if you do think that it might be like a human bone for example to report it and not just pick it up because it could be really old and therefore an interesting site but not forensically important or it could be forensically important um yeah just don't run away with it and if you can wear gloves, then wear gloves, but taking a picture of it is more important. Mm. I'm trying to think. There's so, it's, it's one of those things, actually, that people are fascinated by the programme CSI, right? Um, yeah. And they don't realise that they could actually take a career that kind of combines past and present um, and do forensic archaeology and anthropology. Um, I remember mm -hmm. 
in the undergrad we got to touch upon it and actually forensics was born the study of forensic was born from archaeology so there you go <laughs> not like I, I created it but there you go <laughs> Bournemouth was one of the first courses for forensic archaeology as well yeah yeah I didn't realize how rewarding it would be to go to that university until about maybe two three years later I realized how lucky I was to um, go there and meet the lecturers and work on as many field schools as I was able to do. Mm -hmm. That's my little tip for any graduates out there, contact your um, supervisors or lecturers and ask them if they have any field work going on uh, because most of them have their own personal digs or research they do in the summer. Um, and they might have the budget to take like five to 10 students with them. But they're not yeah. gonna tell everybody, you have to go and approach them and say, look, I really like your research on this. Do you have any opportunities? Um, so that's actually another little fun tip for anybody who needs feel, who would like to get field experience. Um, but for you, actually, if you could give your younger self some advice, either for your undergrad or your masters, for studying archaeology and anthropology, what would it be? I think at undergraduate. Um, my advice to myself would always be stop worrying about all of those essays quite so much and go and do other things that can facilitate archaeology in your spare time. And not even archaeology, just things that are fun because the essays weren't marked. So like in the grand scheme of things, they were just trying to teach you the subject matter. And it felt like it was such a pressure to get them done at the time. But actually, if I was like volunteering at the museum once a week or attending at the extra seminars that were put on, but we just did not have time to go to, like they, it was mainly the master's students and PhD students that went to them and gave them as well. They would have been more beneficial, not even for like a CV, more for just finding out what your interests really are. Um, and for coming up with potential research topics or getting to meet new professors, new tutors that you could go away with um, or you could shadow. Um, yeah, the contacts is, is so key. I, I met Nick Marcus Grant, who is the course director of the Cranfield Forensic Archaeology and Anthropology at Oxford. He taught the physical anthropology module so I was really lucky in that the contacts overlapped, but everyone knows everyone in academic archaeology. Like everyone, you'd be surprised as to everyone's married to someone else whose name you recognise, and they're all they all know each other from somewhere. So if you get into that network with anyone, you're probably then going to be passed on to other people who might be able to help you more. Um, which I didn't know actually until this year. And join CIFA as well. And they've got the special interest groups. Again, I didn't join CIFA till this year because the, the thought of paying for it was really daunting to me. But actually, it's been good. Like the conference, um, the jobs list, just the, spe the special interest groups. There's one in forensic archaeology. I'm also in osteoarchaeology, early careers community archaeology there's loads and again you just get to meet people um another one if you're interested in the more anthro stuff is babio it's b-a-b-a-o and they're again another society they have it's cheaper than sifa there's also like a student uh, version of it which is it's like 10 pounds a year i think and you get to do social events like quizzes um and meet all of the people that I mean, I idolise and I just get to play a pub quiz with them and it's it's pretty surreal, but it's great. Like they are just people. And once you get all of the Babio emails, they advertise jobs, different courses that you can do, um, events, get togethers, conferences, chances to showcase your research. And also if you're doing research, it gives you contacts of people to like ask for advice or ask for if they've had the experience of 
xyz like for my smallpox i could email people who've studied it before and say in this skeleton that you found were these characteristics there because it might not be published but they'd be more than happy to share with you what they found because it's it's their interest people like shared interests that's really great advice actually um join yeah join local networks or join organizations and institutions that could help you network with individuals as you said like-minded individuals with similar interests that's what it's all about in the end and I think actually that's what makes archaeology such a lovely place to, to work in in general because we all have these like similar yet niche interests and when you combine that all together you start really to put the, the puzzle pieces together and a part of archaeology anyway is interpretation and that comes from not just uh, our academic study or our professional studies of something and the experience that we get along the way, but it's life experience, um, our social, um, what's the word? Even one social barriers or the, the society that we live in, um, that, that sort of the concept of how we grew up and how we think also helps us understand the archeology span from a different point of view. Um, and that's very prominent in indigenous archaeology studies right now. And um, we see a shift actually, yeah. if you interpret it this way, I grew up with the, a similar culture and actually this is what it means, not that. Um, so I, I do think there is sometimes conversations do go a long way. I get that the comment, basically what you just said. Um, so I've made videos on books to read, for example, and I'd, for example, said in one of my videos, like at the end, I actually didn't realise that these were all written by the same demographic of person. Um, so I'm going to make another one. And half the comments are, this was great until you said that they're all by men, because what what difference does it make? You're just being sexist. And I have to explain to the people over and over again that we all have different lived experiences. People who write a book are coming from their own perspective. And the perspective of a man is different to a woman. A perspective of people from a different racial background is going to be different. Religion as well, it all plays a part. Um, and I think that's it's a message that people are trying to get out, but I don't know if it's understood completely or whether people are just playing devil's advocate. <laughs> a bit of both, probably. And yeah. I, I think I think what happens as well when something becomes fashionable, um, it becomes an issue in the sense of when we're actually trying to make um, a sustainable change in a constructive way, um, it becomes difficult and uh, it is fashionable to do it as well or to speak about something because... Um, the message does get construed and, and people think one's intentions are different than, than what it is it's, we're not going by a hype um this was happening mm -hmm. a long time before it's just now people are understanding that there is a movement within the archaeological uh, sphere of how we interpret something and how we document something um so it's that's that's a kind of yeah it's really interesting it's social change um it's also what we document in a way um, so yeah, it's. I feel this conversation going for hours. It's one of those things where there's, there's, you know, there's so many different aspects we can look into how and why we study archaeology and anthropology. Um, but I think it comes down to our wanting to learn more. Um, yeah. And and make a better world. You know, like as a society, we should be doing more together to to benefit each other, not just a certain minute. Uh, individuals so it's just so many things that you said I think the things that we need to kind of think about it's um, getting rid of the, the barriers that students uh, and young uh, what's it, I think the technical term is early career paths early career journeys of individuals um, early career professionals that's the correct term now that's, that's the new term I was trying to remember it um, it's yeah helping graduates early career professionals being able to make a change and give them the opportunity to actually change right here right now and not be like it's for the next generation or it's the future generation what well, is actually currently here so it is there's so many different ways we can approach it and I, and I do think wow 
it's just yeah I'm looking forward to these book recommendations and I think you're right actually but you know like there's only so much you can reply to these comments there's only so many times and why waste your energy (laughs) it's what I say (laughs) yeah no it's true because I think half the time they just they're trying to annoy you as well and it's it's sometimes difficult to detach yourself from I mean they're not hate comments by any means um but it's sometimes hard to judge which comments are sincere and which ones are just posted to get a reaction and that comes with experience um I'm still not great at it (laughs) and I've been making YouTube videos for like five years but it's it's a hard one I think you're always gonna get um it's always gonna affect you if it's something that you spend all of your life like working on and some people just are purely interacting to like try and prove you wrong people who are genuinely interested are not the issue by like at all if you've got a genuine genuine question or query or you don't agree with what someone's saying then great it's it's the people who are purely trolling Mm. Just and it's just one of the downsides of making of yeah, making con- vampires. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, there's a really great comment here. Uh, thank you, Joe, for this recommendation. Um, who's just saying American anthropology benefited greatly from the work of Margaret Mead and uh, Zora Neale Hurston. Apologies for the mispronunciation, um, but I think that's brilliant. Um, it just goes to show sometimes the more voices we give or the platform to allow these voices to be heard. I'm sure our interpretation and the many books that have been published and the articles that have been published will change. And that's okay. That's a part of um, understanding. That's a part of knowledge in itself, right? The, how it evolves. It's, uh, it's the fun bit and the not so fun bit when you spent, you know, half your life researching something and you realise you were wrong. So <laughs> <laughs> that's life. <laughs> and um, kind of to, to, to sum up, our, our conversation today um moving on like what's the next step for you because obviously to be honest like I would I would love to see more of your journey at Cranfield and studying forensics there I think it's just so cool very rare actually I don't think I've met a forensic archaeologist I mean working forensic archaeologist so what is your next step I'm hoping um to so like for the near future, um, if my dissertation goes well, I'm hoping to take some time to like try and convert it to a paper or two um, because the subject area is, is so niche that not many people have covered it <laughs> before. Um, and then ultimately I want to do one of the graduate trainee schemes, preferably the Oxford one purely because I have a base there. But it, I just think it will be great to like really learn on the job and learn about commercial archaeology. And one of these trainee schemes is, it's a way in, but also I think it's a nice way in. Like it's not just a, I, I'm more qualified for the trainee scheme. It's like, I will actually be taught everything. And it'll be more of an easing into like a, a proper job as a sort of half half student, half uh, archaeologist. Um, And then that's like six months. Um, I'm like, ah, I would like to do a PhD. If you asked me this during my undergraduate, I'd have been like, absolutely not. No, thank you. (laughs) Because of so much work. But now my my dissertation is my favourite part of my masters I really like researching I like trying to solve like the problem of like filling the gap in the research and for me doing a PhD I think would suit me um the the issue is one funding and two what on earth do I write about (laughs) but my interests are in like non-adult bioarchaeology that's what I'm really like keen on um honestly don't know why 
<laughs> but I think it's because it's like growth and development and so much changes in the skeleton in non-adulthood, childhood. It's just like the biological term for it. Um, and, you know, where does where does adulthood start? What is the correlation between being an adult culturally and being an adult in the skeleton? Um, all of that really, really interests me. And if even if I don't do a PhD, I'd still be looking into that. Like, I don't think I'm ever going to stop that. That's a really Maybe interesting I'll be... subject. Yeah, it's quite random. Like, if, <laughs> if people are like, oh, what's your so? interest? And I'm like, uh, dead children. But it's not just <laughs> that. <laughs> it's quite philosophical what you just said. Like, when do we become an adult? As you said, you're looking at the physical elements, the actual skeleton itself, the skeletal remains. But then on the flip side, a lot of us refer to being an adult as, as mentally, right? The mm. way we approach something, how we speak, how we converse, um, what we do for work, whatever. You know, it's like social constraints. It'll be interesting to see actually what comes out of that if and when you do it. <laughs> Very interesting. <laughs> Yeah, and actually, you just reminded me as well about how uh, children are not as well documented um, in archaeological reports. And I remember hearing that from Maria um, mm -hmm. during our interview. Yeah, she's interview. really into children as well. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting, actually, that uh, she, I remember her mentioning that they would not even say that if there was a child, that they might just tick it a box and that's it. Mm. Um, so it's quite interesting. Yeah. Because that's when, when we're excavating human remains on personally I do find it yeah when, when we excavate you know a neonate a juvenile or adolescent um for different age groups um basically everything from um a baby to 11 12 years old um it's really really interesting because you're you're looking at that individual you can see the size and it's it's so much more I think there's so many more, I think there's more emotions that go on when we excavate younger remains than that yeah. of somebody who's older because you assume okay they must have lived a good life um mm -hmm. you know and I think uh, as an archaeologist archaeologist relationships to death is quite different and and maybe a bit more obscure than others because we we're so we're interested in that that's a part yeah. of our interest right that's like kind of what we do we look at death we look at yeah all stuff. that's funny you point out actually because I was just thinking one of the reasons that that like child bioarchaeology um I think it intrigues me is more because no children should end up in the archaeological record like we're meant to grow up and we like to think that everyone will grow up and live a great life and it's almost like, I guess like forensics, you you want to do that person justice. You want to tell their story. And especially if it's a child, you just want to like give them, give them what they deserve. Like, I don't even know how to explain that. I think you know what I mean though. Like just tell their story. You want to tell the story, yeah. wouldn't it? but I, I think it, it's in a bizarre way, there's more of a human element when we are dealing with child burials, which is a really strange thing to say, but I think because subconsciously we're like, they're too young to go. Yeah. Um, something must have been fatal, and that's when you look at pathology. And, and the fact that you're looking at chickenpox would be quite interesting as well, seeing that relationship, like the correlation of the age as well. Um, yeah, but there's so many, there's, it's just really interesting. It's super fascinating um it really is and I can't yeah so I'm now I'm just thinking about some excavations that I've been on of course um, I've been on a lot of cemetery sites um sometimes you come across them by accident not accident but you know you're not expecting it and other times you know you're going to be on a cemetery site so mentally as well as the archaeologist uh, we are not really um told how to feel how should you feel and only most recently we have something called a mental health 
first aid training. Um, so you're looking at the well-being and make sure the individual is okay who's actually excavating the remains. Because if you're working on a, set, a cemetery site, you know, for six months, and every single day you're looking at human remains, um, it can take its toll on some individuals. So I think that, you know, and it comes kind of comes back to something you said earlier, which is like, you know, the stress that you have from when you're doing research and writing a paper. It's the issue I think we have with a, getting a work-life balance and one's mental health and wellness is something that it's all taboo topics in a way. Um, so it's really interesting how, yeah, it's kind of all interlinked with what you said. And just quickly jumping into the comments. Um, Nigel was just saying, yeah, presumably child mortality would be quite high, really changing from the beginning of the 19th century. And then, yeah, Joe was just saying high death rates for women from complications and childbirth too. Yes, I remember my first dig and there were so many different theories about why um, there were, yeah, there, there were women who were pregnant that we'd found. And there was a large um, area of women and of children as well. Um, and all these theories come up with, you know, why is that? But actually it could come down to complications during childbirth. Um, it's something we see throughout history, coming even some of the royals as well um, have died from childbirth. So. Really interesting things. Oh goodness, this, this, this is going for ages. <laughs> and yes, Nigel, reproduction does seem surprisingly dangerous for yeah. species. You are correct on that one. <laughs> it is really fascinating. You can see why people really do take to studying osteology and, and human remains in general. I must admit, I did choose at one point GIS over it. And then I went back to it because um, I thought, you know, GIS is where the money is. So I need to learn how to do GIS. But actually, with what I ended up doing, um, human remains and learning that that was, was more important. Um, and the skills I've developed over time, as, as you said as well earlier, um, literally field experience. No, Joe. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not even going to say that, Joe. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> Actually, I misread that. I thought it said something else. Have you ever heard? I'll tell you in a moment, actually, offline. Um, Joe, I'll, I'll message you what I thought that I said. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so it's just sort of that I've actually forgotten now. Joe, you've, you've lost my train of thought. My amazing epilogue has been ruined. <laughs> oh no, what was I saying? Oh my goodness, apologies everybody. My, my brain is frazzled today. Um, but actually, Rosie, it reminds me of what you were saying earlier about um, field experience again, um, in the sense of what we, the experiences we can get whilst at undergraduate, postgraduate, and the, the networks that we create during that time is so important, so crucial. Like today, I was actually at um, a site that I visited during my undergrad. I was back there today and I was like, wow, I haven't been here for like eight, you know, nine, nine, ten years. Um, and the people still, you know, there's that link. It's always a one degree of separation with archaeologists. Um, but yeah. <laughs> right, I'm, st I'm not reading any more comments, Joe. You're distracting me. <laughs> but before we sum up, because I just realised the time. Apologies, Rosie. Um, is there any last questions for Rosie? And is there anything Rose, that you'd like to add while we're waiting? Maybe about so uh, social media wise, what you hope to do next? What video do you have for yeah. us? Uh, I have a vlog, well, in a sense, I didn't film as much as I expected to, but of my dig week, I need to get around to editing it because it takes so long. <laughs> um, and the thought of starting it, is actually really daunting, but I need to do that. Um, the I, the issue I've got is I have to like blur out all the background and because it's a new site, there can't be any chance of someone like working out where it is basically, um, just in case, because <laughs> we don't really know what's there yet. Um, and then, I need to do some more vlogs generally. I've been planning to do like a series on more teaching stuff 
for so long and also like a reaction to bones because i've never seen it and i've been saving watching it until i could react to it like with friends like once lockdowns ended um but i haven't got around to it yet so you can expect that at some point and probably a good reaction to csi as well but i'd need one of my friends who did who actually did like csi at undergrad because they know a bit more that'd be cool i do love reaction ones yep so great question from joe best strategy for fighting history of misinformation on youtube it's a difficult one there's always going to be different interpretations of of history um so you can't just straight up tell people that they're wrong because we weren't there you know um we don't know we're right and that almost makes an us and them sort of thing like we we can't have a superiority complex it's a privilege to have the knowledge and the the ability to to do archaeology in the way that we do and gatekeeping it is not going to help anyone <laughs> but also i've had comments for example where on on my teaching videos um where and it is it is men um write paragraphs and paragraphs and paragraphs about how how uh, i'm wrong <laughs> um and how in their in their work in their book that they wrote which is fictional and actually they don't have any background in archaeology so like if they were right great but a lot of the time I knew from my studies like what they were saying just wasn't and it's really easy to get sucked into a comment war um but again it's the sort of people that comment like that don't even want to be told what's right they are right in their eyes and it won't it, they will never change from that that's their view and they're sticking with it so like fighting misinformation i think the best way to do it is just to keep making the teaching videos putting all the references that you've read in the pinned comment giving several several potential reasons for things that you're saying so like i made a video on whether neanderthals had language it it was not like a straight up yes they did it was a balanced not like an argument but I tried to make it as balanced as possible. So if I said one thing, I'd say, well, actually, another paper says this. Um, and I think that is the best way to do it, because then people can sort of make up their own mind about about what they think based on the evidence, which is all we do anyway. As archaeologists, it's all our own interpretations, but presenting the right information um, and making sources more accessible because everyone can could read if they if they wanted to like but there's paywalls and you need institutional email addresses and being able to share that information for free i think also helps so i should probably make more videos <laughs> <laughs> don't put too much on yourself <laughs> but yes more videos please especially study cheap ones i remember your one about um i think you did one about the pelvis I think you were doing one yeah. about how to how to yeah how to sex a um, human skeleton. I think that was great. I liked the drawing. Did you draw that as well? Yeah, took ages. <laughs> <laughs> I had a lot of time on my hands in in lockdown. <laughs> well, we have gone past the hour and thirty minute mark. Um, Rose, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you today, and thank you for everybody who tuned in. Uh, and for your contributions in the chat, don't forget to hit that like, share and subscribe button and head over to Rosie's channel uh, for some more in-depth discussions that she may be having and some book recommendations and her experiences as now a master student at Cranfield. But also you can go back and see her time at Oxford University. So for anybody who's looking into studying archaeology at those institutions, for instance, can look at that as examples or just in general. So you want to study archaeology? You know, mm -hmm. Why? Well, here you go. Have a look and, and think about it. And I know we never actually got on to why you study archaeology, but that's not the point of this conversation. This conversation is to show that we are individuals 
and there are so many people out there who are studying who are working in archaeology there's just different avenues that we all take and everybody is unique everybody is different um, you just gotta find your career path so thank you everybody so much for tuning in Rosie is there anything else you'd like to add before we wrap up no I, I think I've said everything not that I can recall everything that I've just said <laughs> Thank you for having me. It's been great. Well, no, thank you. Thank you so much for for coming in and, and apologies uh, for having to push the live stream. But uh, I must tell everybody a secret. We were supposed to have it last week, but the football was on. So <laughs> football took priority and we won. So it's OK. <laughs> it was worth it. <laughs> but I don't know actually any of the footballers. So I do need to do my homework. Um, but anyway, thank you, everybody, so much for tuning in. And we will put the recommendation links that Rosie has mentioned and also what I mentioned in regards to getting a job in archaeology um, in the description below. So that'll be updated within the next hour or so. So thank you everybody so much for tuning in. Keep up to date with the channel by hitting that bell button. Um, I do have a change in the schedule coming up due to my work commitments. Um, but if you head over to YouTube, uh, my Instagram account, you will see generally every day kind of what's going on and why I'm being so all over the place and disorganized. But it's out of my hands, literally, because archaeology we cannot control and construction work is uh, definitely a, a, another topic of discussion. But <laughs> thank you all so much for tuning in and we'll see you all next time. Bye, everyone. <laughs>